Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. George Nori with you, Robert Morningstar with us. Robert is a civilian intelligence analyst, psychotherapist in New York City, also an FAA licensed pilot, instrument ground instructor. Robert has studied the paranormal and UFOs for more than 60 years and has written extensively to expose NASA's use of disinformation technology. Here he is back on Coast to Coast. Mr. Morningstar, how are you? Mr. Nori, I am very happy and honored to be on the program. Just yesterday, a friend of mine in California uh, wrote to me about being uh, faced with orbs and uh, seeing ruby eyes in the orbs. And this is now becoming a more common phenomenon. There's a wonderful interview on YouTube with Danny Jones interviewing Chris Bledsoe and his daughter. Uh huh. And Chris Bledsoe... It's a three-hour interview. I recommend it to everyone. You have to take it in, in small doses, half an hour. I can stand an hour, but I've replayed it because this gentleman went through something really terrible back in 2007. He went on a fishing trip with his son and his uh, co-workers. This man really went through something. He had missing time when he went uh, on this fishing trip. He thought he, he climbed up a hill and thought he saw the setting sun, and when he broke over the crest of the hill. It was not a setting sun. It was a brilliant UFO and then a second one. And he hid in the bushes and, and tried to stay undercover. Then he went back and he thought he'd been gone for 20 minutes. And they said to him, where have you been? You've been gone all night. He said, what do you mean? I just was gone for 20 minutes. He said, no, no, you've been gone all night and your son isn't here either. He went looking for you. So he went and he found his son and his son was in a state of shock. But to make a long story short, he encountered a type of extraterrestrial which is immaterial in its form as a UFO. It looks like a UFO, brilliant light or a red light. And I've heard this before from many people over the years have taken pictures of orbs and they claim that they saw eyes or faces inside the orbs. Mm -hmm. And right. describes an orb following him and settling a couple of feet away, and suddenly he saw red eyes inside the orb looking at him. Oh. He was startled. Then the orb came closer, and suddenly there was a little extraterrestrial. He said it was about the size of a four-year-old boy staring at him, and that he was close enough to touch it. And he was told by NASA, it's a good thing you didn't touch it because it could have killed you. These creatures are kind of spiritual and, and material creature. They're called transmorphic entities in the MJ-12 documentation. They are entities that are pure mind energy, come from another dimension, can enter into our dimension and assume any shape or form that they wish to, whether it's a, an inanimate object or an extraterrestrial as their form uh, demonstrates. They're diminutive in size, and they can change from a morphological humanoid shape and then just zip back into a, what I consider to be a plasma state where they become the orb. So there are different kinds of UFOs. There are flying saucers, you know, and there are mechanical devices with high technology involving quantum physics and uh, uh, zero-point energy. Things like the Roswell crash, you know, nuts and bolts. All right. But there's another kind that's a spiritual entity, and we may as well call them angels and demons. Are they ETs? Yes, they are ETs. But listen, I notified Tucker Carlson a couple of days ago that we were going to have this show. And lo and behold, yesterday he was on a, on a program, and he said that he thought that aliens are not from other planets that they've always been here, 
that they are spiritual entities and that they are both good and evil and that he hears from knowledgeable people that the United States government has made contact with them and we know this contact happened long ago really uh, starting actually before Roswell I think it was on your program earlier this year that I spoke about the Einstein Oppenheimer letter of June 1947 which discussed how to integrate a celestial race that has decided to settle on Earth. And Oppenheimer and Einstein went through uh, a lot of uh, legalisms and uh, jurisprudence and international treaties, but ultimately what they recommended to the United States government was to sign a secret treaty with the aliens. They called them EBEs or Celestrians and to give them settlement rights, ranging rights, and in return for tutelage. This is the word that Oppenheimer used, because he thought that these entities were the return of the old gods of the Old Testament to the earth. And he felt that he and Einstein were the new priesthood who would settle and establish a third covenant with these entities. And he also told the government to keep it absolutely secret from the American people and from the rest of the world. Where do you stand on this, Robert? I stand on the the platform that these entities are not gods, but they have fooled human beings into believing that they are gods. Uh Aha. And that they are rapacious aliens who do not have our best interests at heart, and that they are leading us into wars against each other in the hope of destroying humankind. They want the earth, they want its resources, they don't want human beings on it. And there is an occult group of politicians, you might as well call them Illuminati, or New World Order, that have sold their souls to these entities in return for affluence, fame, power, security, as they think of it, but... There's no security when you've traded your soul. No, it's short term, believe me. Right, short term. So I I warn people, they are trying to get us all riled up. When the Bible talks about fallen angels, Robert, Yes. are they talking about ETs that have come down or something more spiritual? I think it's both. Here's, Here's the deal. The watchers who are described in the Book of Enoch, led by Azazel and Samyaza, they decided to tamper with the God's plan for humanity. They were just supposed to watch and protect guardians. But they fell in love with the idea of being physical, and they decided to make a pact to go in unto women and to produce a race that was a hybrid race of angels and humans. And these were the Nephilim. But they were... Uh, they were horrible creatures. They were gigantic in size, and they looked down upon humanity and started to destroy humanity. They started to eat human beings. And the book of Enoch says that Enoch was approached by the watchers after their fall. What happened is they were cut off from heaven. In their natural state, they could be in heaven and they could come down to earth and they could return and back and forth, and they were in constant contact with the Godhead. But when they committed this this sin of breaking their their covenant or the the mission, they went in onto women and they produced a a strange hybrid. They were cut off from heaven. The reason why Noah's flood, right? Yes, Noah's flood was the result of the the spread of this uh, degenerate, race of giants, uh, primarily, and the, the chaos that they'd caused. And so uh, the flood was sent to wipe them out. And the flood story is throughout the world, throughout the Middle East, but the flood story about giants is also to be found in Central Asia. I found a book by Nicholas Rorick, who traveled extensively through Central Asia. He fled Russia after the revolution and headed down to India and Tibet, And as he passed through those countries, he picked up a lot of stories. And he heard a story about a giant who had survived the flood by swimming. And then we come to the 
recent years and modern times with the stories of the giants that were found in Afghanistan. And I heard about the killing of a giant by the U.S. Armed Forces many, many years ago, and yeah. I was dubious. We had I, that story with Stephen Quayle. Yeah, he broke that story, but I actually met a Marine who told me, yes, I was part of that platoon, and the, the thing was gigantic. It was 18 feet high and as wide as two men, and he ripped the head off one soldier and ripped the arms off the other, and it took everything they had to, uh, to bring it down. Remember that Obama and all the European leaders were making trips to Afghanistan? Right. It apparently had something to do with either having found a portal or this body of a giant and a race of giants. Or, bo- or both. Or both, yes. I, you took the words right out of my mouth. Now, with regard to Christmas, it's a mystical aspects, it's mythical aspects. The myth of Christmas is that it happened in December. And I wanted to make a distinction between the cosmic Christmas and the terrestrial Christmas. What is that difference, Robert? The cosmic Christmas was the birth of light at the creation of of the universe, at the Big Bang. The, The birth of light was the birth of life and love and creativity and the cosmic Christ, Christ Mass. Secondly, in the material world, there is... Divinity wants to partake and participate in the material world. So God created man so that he or it could interact with man out of love. God created this universe out of love and loneliness, is my belief. And that second Christmas was the birth of Jesus Christ, where divinity came down into incarnation. But this incarnation, again, involves celestial influences. It involved the benign, benevolent angels, Gabriel, Michael, Raphael, who are the protectors of mankind. They are called the heavenly hosts, the army of God. That's their mission, isn't it? To protect us? It's to preserve life on earth and to protect us from the fallen ones, the demons. The watchers sinned. They became encased in matter. They could no longer travel back up to quote-unquote heaven. They could not have direct communion and communication with God, which they had before. And it's very interesting to read the account in Enoch of their despondency, their depression, like the worst crash, the worst crash any drug addict could ever experience is described in these fallen angels when they crashed to earth. They were cut off from from heaven, and they were weeping and crying and lamenting their sin in the desert. And they called Enoch and said, Enoch, please go ask God to forgive us. They wanted to repent, I guess. I suppose, but, but their sin was so great that when Enoch went before God and asked to intercede uh, you know, on behalf of the watchers, God said to him, no, go tell the watchers that they should have been here interceding for man not man, interceding for them. They will not be forgiven. And then he calls Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Phanuel, four archangels, and he says, see what the watchers have done to the earth. See the abominations and the crimes that they are committing. Go down, bind Azazel and Samael, uh, Samayaza and his cohort, and bury them in, in the desert. Bury them on their backs with, so they can see up bury them and cover them with stones so the sunlight never reaches them, and then lead the children of the watchers into wars with each other so that they may destroy each other and protect mankind. So that, in essence, is the, the, the basis of this extraterrestrial war that's being waged on planet Earth between the forces of good and the forces of evil, and the forces of evil hate mankind. That is Satan. Lucifer, the devil himself. And George, I was warned 42 years ago. I had a near-death experience. A ghost came to my bedside, confronted me, and he said to me, a diabolical entity has taken over the world's great religions to corrupt mankind and to destroy humanity. Could that be the Antichrist? That is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is waging war against Christ, who is life, 
and waging war against humanity. Take a quick second. Where do people get your e-books? Well, uh, you can write to me at uh, robert.morningstar at gmail.com, and I have a UFO uh, chronicles, a compendium of all the most important documents uh, that I've compiled from uh, the U- UFOs. And I also have Mars, the four faces of Mars, it's called the Martian Revelation. And, of course, I have uh, my work on JFK. What do esoteric and occult themes have in common with the music group Blondie? Writer and musician Gary Lockman tells us all. Gary, welcome to the show. This is a treat. Oh, thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure. When you, your music career and this career, two distinct, incredible careers, how did you trans, how did you do that transition from one to the other? This is amazing. Um, well, I first became interested in the sorts of things I write about when I was playing in Blondie, um, back, back in, uh, 1975, which, uh, dates, dates me quite a bit. <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, yeah, I was living on, uh, the Bowery in New York with, uh, Debbie Harry, and uh, Chris Stein was a guitarist. We were in a dilapidated loft space, not far from uh, the club CBGB, where all the bands from New York scene were playing. And um, one of the people who shared this loft space with, with us was very interested in the occult and in magic and in um, the uh, sort of dark magician Aleister Crowley in particular. And I just became sort of um, interested in it from, from being around these people. And there was one book in particular that I read at the time. Uh, it was called simply The Occult, and it was by a British writer named Colin Wilson, uh, who wrote quite a bit about it. And I just became fascinated with it and started reading about it. And then over the years, what began as a kind of, you know, naive, enthusiastic, um, you know, interest in this kind of thing gradually became what I hope is uh, more of a kind of serious study. And it took a long time. I didn't start writing until the early 90s. I mean, when I, I dropped out of music uh, in the early 80s and uh, went through a kind of career change, uh, thought I was going to be uh, academic for a while. That didn't work out, but by the early 90s, I started writing about these things for different magazines, and uh, that gradually turned into writing books about it. And you're very prolific. How many books now? I mean, the secret teachers of the Western world would make, would make what number? Uh, I think I'm just. I think I'm just one... One short of twenty. That's amazing. So I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm working on a book now, uh, precisely about this British writer Colin Wilson, who died uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so that I think that will be my twentieth book. Knock on wood. Our dear friend Mitch Can't Horowitz uh, thinks so. I, I was, I'm reading the quote that he has written here uh, on your book, and uh, he's just been a great guest of ours for so many years. Gary, uh, he's a great guy. He's an editor at uh, at uh, Penguin Torture. Who, who publishes me? Yep. And so we've had a long, we've had a long, uh, you know, working relationship. And uh, no, he, 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 he's a, he's a, he's a very insightful writer about these sorts of things as well. I want to spend just a little time talking about the band Blondie as we lead into your work here, uh, the Secret Teachers of the Western World, in the couple hours that we've got you. What was the moment, that deciding moment, Gary, when when the band knew we hit it big? Um, well, I guess, I mean, I, I played with them early on, the early days, um, 75, 77, uh, the first couple albums. Um, you know, in the early days, we played in New York, and we were we were the band least likely to succeed. I mean, we were <laughs> fourth on the bill. You know, we were, basically, we got gigs because people like looking at Debbie. Yeah. Um, you know, we, but, uh, no, uh, what had happened was in uh, early 1976, we hunkered down in our loft space, and um, we spent a couple months uh, working on new material and rehearsing and really getting our act together, literally. And then we started doing shows, and it was a transformed Blondie, and we were a much better band. And we started uh, attracting a lot more attention, and the, the whole New York scene in general was attracting more people from, you know, sort of the, the, the tri-state area. People from Connecticut and, and Jersey were coming over to the Bowery and hanging out. A song I wrote, actually, is called Ex Offender, mm-hmm. the first Blondie single. That got the attention of a producer named Richard Gotterer, who had been around since the 1960s. Uh, he wrote My Boyfriend's Back. It was a big... Uh, oh, sure, album. yeah song in the early 60s, and I think he also produced Hang On Sleepy and, and you know, hits from that, that era. Now, he came down, because uh, you know, all these kind of people, all the suits were starting coming from uptown. You know, they wouldn't go down, you know, past 23rd Street, but then they started because the 
you know, the rock press started writing about the scene in uh, New York and bands like the Ramones and Patti Smith and Talking Heads. And so they started to come down and um, they just heard Debbie and they thought, no, this is it. You know, uh, you know, this is, and this is a good song. And it was, it was, um, it was a period when um, kind of people were getting back to the roots of rock, you know, that went through a long patch where you had these sort of uh, super groups and these kind of operatic, you know, bands like Yes and Emerson Lake and Palmer. And I think people were getting a bit tired of this kind of, you know, overblown, big Wagnerian kind of sound, and they were looking for something simpler. And that's what was happening there. And, uh, yeah, that's what happened. Richard Goddard assigned us to do a single. Uh, we did a single, my song, Ex Offender. They kind of took off from there. Did you uh, did you ever make the TV scene, with, like the Ed Sullivan Show or American Bandstand? Did the Ed Sullivan Show, but there was something called Don Kirshner's Rock Concert that was on... Uh, Late at night on Friday nights, and um, I, I I I did that, and there was a, a couple others. I mean, it's quite some time ago now, but I, I actually I actually wrote a book about it. I wrote a book called New York Rocker: My Life in the Blank Generation, and it's about my my years playing in Blondie. And I, I also played with Iggy Pop uh, for a while. Uh, he's sort of the grandfather of punk rock. You know, he was you know, the group called Iggy and the Stooges in the late '60s, and he worked with people like David Bowie and. Uh, Wrote about that, and then I had I had my own band for a while. So yeah, there's a book, New York Rocker, that covers from about 1974 to 1981 when I was uh, um, you know running around playing playing rock music. Yeah, that's fascinating. We're still dear friends with uh, Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. Great guitarist that he is. Great guitarist. Yes. This this transition then, while you were doing this, because as you said, you were interested in the occult really all your life. As you made this tra- this this transition, tell me about the title, "The Secret Teachers of the Western World," because this is very important. Uh, well, actually, a friend suggested the title because we were, we uh, how should we say it? Uh, she was saying how there isn't one book sort of bringing together um, the story of what you, what we what you want to call the esoteric tradition or the Western inner tradition. Um, Give me a little background on that. It's like from about the 60s, people dissatisfied with sort of Western religion, Mm -hmm. Western philosophies, look to the East for some some kind of enlightenment, look to Eastern philosophies, Buddhism or Hinduism and so on, uh, for some kind of spirituality. But uh, in the West itself, there's a whole tradition of this, but it's been more or less obscured. or kind of uh, presented in rather, uh, I don't know, kitschy kind of scary ways as sort of uh, the occult or, you know, Satanism or something like that. But there's actually a a long tradition of this kind of inner spirituality within the West itself. The idea was that although the mainstream philosophies and basically science and mainstream philosophy has has basically tried to uh, ignore this, or to uh, dismiss it completely as a superstition, it nevertheless has informed all of Western culture uh, for the last, you know, couple thousand years, more or less. And so that's why the, it's the secret teachers, the secret in the sense that they're not that well known, or they've been obscured, hidden, or what they actually teach is kind of secret. And that's that's another meaning of the word esoteric. It really means inner, but it also has this connotation of being something that's. You know, it's slightly hidden, something that you actually have to kind of work towards a bit to find. That was the idea. The idea was to show, tell the story of this tradition in the book itself. I look at it in the context of, jumping ahead a little bit here, I look at it in the context of developments in split-brain psychology. You, you, you and your, your, your listeners may know that we have you know, our, the, the, the human brain, the, mm-hmm. the cerebral cortex, is separated into two hemispheres. And over the years, we discovered that they actually approach and interact with the world in very different ways. And um, there's a wonderful book that came out a few years ago called The Master and His Emissary by a neuroscientist who's also an English scholar uh, named Ian McGilchrist. And he basically rebooted the whole split-brain story, uh, showing that the two sides of the brain, while they may do the same sorts of things, they do them in very different ways. But he also argued that there's a kind of rivalry between them, that the two sides are kind of in competition with each other. And he argued that in the last few centuries, the left side of the brain, which is associated with logic and analysis and and rational thought and sequential sort of thought, has gained the upper hand. 
and this older, more intuitive, more sort of poetic, even more mystical, we might say, kind of way of approaching uh, reality and understanding it has been sort of dismissed and obscured. And that's the sort of the, the narrative that I'm saying in the book, is that this whole other tradition that's part of our whole heritage, and it's actually part of our own psychology, has been kind of obscured and um, kind of pushed out of the picture, air- airbrushed out of the picture by this other uh, mode of consciousness that's gained, gained more dominance. So I just try to show that even though it's been kind of sold short and painted in this kind of picture of being sort of silly superstition, it's nevertheless informed, you know, people from Shakespeare and Goethe and the Renaissance and Plato and all of the sort of, you know, m- many of the great figures of Western culture. What were you, what would these people be saying today, Gary, with what's happening on this planet right now? I mean, uh, just unbelievable. And we had that. <laughs> they'd be saying oy vey. My God. <laughs> I think they'd be shaking their heads saying, what, you know, what, 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 went, what went wrong? Yeah. But I think they'd also be trying to figure out if there was some way we can approach it uh, to understand it. That is one big question there. And, uh, you know, it would be very, very difficult to encapsulate quickly what they would be saying. But. I think many of them would be saying that perhaps if we didn't leave this whole other side of ourselves out, this whole other more intuitive way of approaching the world, uh, it might not be quite uh, quite as bad as it is. But yes, it's we're, we're in pretty bad shape these days. I, I think I've witnessed so many things happening on this planet from, you know, Vietnam, uh, mm. Ken Kennedy's assassination. I was 13 years old when that happened. Uh, and we've just seen so many things happen on this planet. But at this point right now, I've never seen the planet so topsy-turvy. Uh, it's almost as if these leaders don't know how to lead anymore and that everything is well, run I, amok. I'm, I'm not surprised you say that. In fact, one of the themes I talk about in the book is this idea that this dominant sort of rational, logical Scientific. I mean, for sake, I'm, all, all these words are in sort of quotation marks. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in generality. Yeah, I understand. It's starting to break down. It's starting to kind of come apart and sort of deconstruct itself. I think one of the results of that is that we do, we, we are living in this time where it seems, it seems a great deal of chaos. So there seems a lot of conflicting, you know, different things that we, we're trying to achieve, but they, they're conflicting with each other. So they're sort of negating each other. And I'm not surprised that the people, you know, who are supposed to be leading the world, the nations of the world, that they're, they're just as confused as everybody else. And yes, it's a, it's a dangerous time. Now, the hope is that out of this kind of time of chaos and mess and confusion, some new revitalized vision may emerge. But exactly what that's going to be, uh, I don't think anybody knows at the moment. No. These teachers in the Western world... Were they widely accepted, or did they have to do a lot of their work undercover? Well, at different times. See, that's one of the surprising things if you look into this, is that a great deal of the types of ideas and philosophies that contemporary sort of mainstream thinking rejects the superstitious were at one time accepted and were, in fact, prestigious. Now, I'll give you one example. Isaac Newton, you know, the father of modern science, Mm -hmm. father of the modern world, basically, discovered gravity. He wrote more about alchemy than he did about gravity. He wrote more about what was called the occult sciences at the time when he was working uh, in the early 1700s. Occult just means hidden, and it's the same principle as when we have an eclipse, when the, sort of the moon passes between the earth and the, and the sun. It occludes the sun, so it's something that obscures something. It, it you know hides something. So the occult just basically means the unseen. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.